Good evening, conference. I'm really delighted to be uh, chairing the session this afternoon that will look at how we can protect Britain's wildlife. And I'm absolutely delighted to have such an amazing panel of speakers um, with us tonight. Not just one, but three incredibly wise and experienced uh, experts to um, talk about how we can best protect Britain's wildlife. And I know that we will leave this room feeling far more inspired, um, perhaps, than we might have felt if we'd been sitting through lots of standing orders and so forth uh, when we came in. So I'm going to introduce our panel and then just say uh, a very few words by way of introduction and then hand over uh, to them. So first of all, Satish Kumar is, I'm sure, well known to many of you by reputation, if not uh, in person. He is a former monk, a long-term peace and environment activist, editor of the splendid Resurgence and Ecologist magazine. He co-founded Schumacher College and was its program director from 1991 to 2010 and is still a visiting fellow there. He also founded the Small School in Devon and is a vice president of the RSPCA. And downstairs you'll find a stall with many of his books and magazines on it and I really urge you to go and uh, see what wonderful things are there. So, I want us to have plenty of time for questions and discussions, so I only wanted to just say a very few words, really, about, well, just a flavour, I suppose, of the political debate, or lack of it, on this issue, on nature and wildlife at Westminster. Politicians are often accused of being out of touch with public opinion, and with some exceptions, of course, um, they're pretty right, unfortunately, and I think that's certainly the case when it comes to wildlife. In November, just a few months ago, an independent survey by Comrades revealed the love that people have for nature. Notably, 83% of the British public believe that the natural environment should be protected at all costs, while only a quarter think the government is doing enough to protect our landscapes and wildlife. And I think there really is a very clear gap between a government that might from time to time choose to talk the talk, but when you actually look at what they're doing, there is a huge gap between what's said and what's actually being done. And I was just going to give a very few examples. So take marine conservation zones, for an example, an incredible vision of sustainable seas and how sustainable seas could be brought about through a network of marine conservation zones and that would benefit fish and dolphin and sharks and seals, the UK's amazing cold water coral reefs and other marine life, as well as being good for the livelihoods of those fisher communities that depend upon it. So here's this really great vision. And yet, in reality, what we have is just a very few of those zones are actually being taken forward. Most, like the Brighton offshore MCZ, are held on hold because of a supposed lack of data. But inaction and prevarication is not the route to create an ecologically coherent network of marine protected areas, and it's something we absolutely have to challenge, I think. In other examples, you'll know that we've seen a huge amount of brilliant campaigning by lots of campaign groups, lots of individuals like yourselves, hours of political debate on badgers, for example, and bees, and yet we see the government acting um, with a complete disregard, really, of evidence. We have seen the budget cuts to DEFRA and the Environment Agency, alongside the pernicious new duty to promote economic growth, which has been imposed on natural England and other non-economic regulators, as they are so nicely described. And the final quick example I was going to give was of the Natural Capital Committee, a committee that was set up by DEFRA to advise the government it published its first annual State of Natural Capital report in October. And basically, it puts a giant price tag on the services the natural environment provides and urges the government to take concerted action to embed the vision of natural capital in the, natural, in the national accounts and policy-making processes as early as possible. And while you know, some of that idea might not be a, a bad one, it's certainly something to be dealt with very, very carefully because there's certainly, I would think, quite a risk that valuing nature in this way, in terms of just simply trying to put a price tag on it, could actually drive further destruction rather than actually protecting the, uh, uh, the, the, the natural environment and the wildlife and the habitats that we depend on. At the very least, we need some very strong safeguards, I think, including in the planning system, to ensure that by putting that pound sign on precious ecosystems such as ancient woodlands, we don't inadvertently open the door to their destruction. And of course, Oscar Wilde famously spoke of those who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. However, I do not want to leave you on a gloomy note because there is um, 
plenty of good news out there as well. And in particular, I know all of our speakers have a really positive vision of how our environment could be. And certainly when it comes to spurring people to action, I think it's very much the vision of what could be rather than only a critique of what is that actually is the best spur to action and behavior change. So on that note, I'm really honored to hand over to Satish Kumar, who'll be our first speaker. <clears throat> It's a um, great pleasure to be part of the Green Party Spring Conference and, uh, and participate in this session chaired by my dear friend Caroline and sharing with two uh, great colleagues. <clears throat> As Caroline said, some happy, uh, hopeful notes at the end, um, there is some very good work uh, being done to protect the rural England and, and countryside, and therefore some wildlife in that countryside. And the work of organizations such as the National Trust and Con uh, Council for the, or Ca Campaign for the Protection of Rural England, and many other similar organizations are doing some very good work. So there is that hopeful note. But, the main picture, as Caroline mentioned, is a kind of obsession that our country has with building, building, building. Even what agriculture, what we have today, is very much an industrial agriculture, an agribusiness, and huge farms uh, managed with big machinery and big chemical farming and, and fertilizers and pesticide, all spraying. And so there's very little space left for the wildlife to survive and thrive and flourish. So time has come when we need to challenge this idea of ever continuing, ever growing industrialization of our countryside. Industrial agriculture, but also every town small or large, uh, more building, more industrial parks, more business centers, and more uh, supermarkets, more car parks. If there's no space left for the, um, for the wildlife to survive and flourish, if there's no space there, everything is concrete and building, somehow it is in our culture here, it is not really culture, our civilization seems to think that unless a land is built with an airport or hotel or car park is undeveloped. The word development means that it's co concretized. It's something built on it. Uh, it has to be a, a shopping center. There is a development. If it's a countryside, rural, um, that is undeveloped. That mindset, that mentality has to be challenged. And we have to say that the land, pristine, rural, um, uh, uh, rural um, uh, hills, mountains, forests, they are not undeveloped. And what we are doing by bringing, clearing them and bringing um, agriculture, agriculture which is industrialized and factory farming, and the factory farming is growing. The, our farms are become, becoming like, like monsters. Um, uh, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 cows on one farm and hardly they can move anywhere, pigs or cows or any other chickens. So if we go on this kind of industrial farming and factory farming and no space left for the, uh, for the rural um, activities and wildlife uh, uh, flourishing and, and, and surviving, then we are not going to have any wildlife left. But government, Labour Party, Tory Party, Liberal Party, industry, business, um, CBI, all those big, big leading organizations, they have no, seems as if they have no interest in the countryside, they have no interest uh, in wildlife. Never mind wildlife, even normal rural life is not there, how any wildlife can come and flourish there. So. Um, hill farms, small-scale farms, and, and certain amount of countryside should be left alone. No development, nothing, not even farming. They should be left alone for the natural, wild um, life to flourish. 
unless we challenge the industrial mindset, building houses, we have got 700,000 houses empty. And yet, every day, I hear from ministers and even opposition leaders to say, we don't have enough housing. The biggest crisis in England is lack of housing, more affordable housing, more housing. What about those 700,000 empty homes? Before you allow any new house to be built, let's fill those empty homes. And if any empty home is empty, left without, uh, without um, using it, then I think after six months or a year, that uh, house should be paying a big, huge tax. Otherwise, um, homeless people on the one hand, and we are building new houses on the other hand, and, and, and houses are just as if it's investment. So we need to challenge this industrial mindset. Industrialization has gone enough. Enough industrialization. Now we need ruralization. And, and uh, small towns, small villages, and countryside, if we can leave some spaces like Moors, Dartmoor, Exmoor, um, Yorkshire Moor, Bodmin Moor, these should be left as a sacred sites for the wildlife. These are sacred places. And my love is Dartmoor, because I live in North Devon, and, and I always go over the moor um, to, to Schumacher College. And I see all the time is kind of tourism and more hotels and more uh, car parks and more um, buildings all the time happening. And this, this, is how, this is how we are destroying our countryside. So my great passion is to say that leave certain areas totally alone. Even national parks are not enough uh, are left alone, not sacred enough uh, for them. They want to encroach. Um, many new roads have been built going over Dartmoor or around Dartmoor or around national parks. And uh, now we are thinking of uh, um, government and Labour Party, uh, they are all proposing to build this new um, uh, railway line. That will bring a lot of destruction to rural countryside and wildlife. And then they are proposing to build a third runway at Heathrow and more airports and more, more of, I mean, as if global warming, climate change, this flooding, this uh, kind of uh, weather we have just witnessed this winter has nothing happened and business as usual. So this has to be challenged and only, only organization who can challenge is Green Party. You and us here in this room and in this um, conference. And so it is our responsibility to take the wildlife protection and, and conservation of rural countryside and protection of rural side. That is our, has to be our responsibility. And in order to do that, we have to develop an idea that this, these wild places are sacred places and they are places for the spirit, for walking, and for people, I'm not saying that those places should not be gone for people. The people and wildlife can complement each other if we go lightly, if our footprint is small, if we go walking there and just observing and watching the birds and watching the deer and watching the hedgehogs and watching, um, and you will hear more about hedgehogs. So all, all that is fine, but all the building and, and development, the idea of development must be challenged. Development should become a dirty word. No more development. That will be my, uh, my plea. So I hope Green Party can lead. Thank you. So I hope the Green Party can give a lead in this field and get uh, a National Trust and uh, WWF and, and all the other green organizations to, to come on board and say that uh, industrialization has gone on enough, enough, and no more buildings. We have got enough buildings. Because the building companies and building organizations, they are sort of instruments of economic growth. They are building not because people need it. They are building because building brings economic growth, economic activity. I think that economic growth is non-economic growth. It's not a growth. Uh, so uh, the, the, the economy has somehow become such a kind of sacred word. And the economy is stupid. It's, it's a stupid, it's economy is really stupid. So we have to challenge that and, and protect the wildlife. Because why, as Henry David Thoreau said, that without wildlife there's no life. For human beings to be healthy, happy, and, and flourish, 
We need wildlife. We need wild mountains. We need wild animals. We need all that. And George Monbiot's book uh, is wonderful in that um, uh, sphere. So that would be my plea, and I'm delighted that Green Party Conference is addressing this issue and, and, and highlighting this issue as an important issue. Thank you very much.